Well, hello there, it's Keith here, and we have a couple of Game Boys on screen here. Uh, once again, we're back to YQuest on the Game Boy. We've made it a bit better though, we're using hardware sprites. Now, I promised we would, and I have done it. So here is the new version. If I just start this up on the Game Boy Black and White, you can see now our play is moving nice and smoothly. Uh, very, very nice indeed. So we've had a bit of an improvement there. So um, this is the new version, and we're using hardware sprites, as you can see. Uh, looks like maybe I need to change the boundary checking there. It went slightly off screen, but we can fix that. So that was the Game Boy regular version. This is the Game Boy Color version, and you can see it's in color, so yay for us. Now, if I go over to the source code over here. Okay, so let's have a look at the source code for today's work then. Now, the first thing that's changed is we've changed the data definitions of the objects. If you remember, there was a byte spare before. That byte is now used. Now, for each object, we're going to define a hardware sprite number. Now, the Game Boy can do a total of 40 hardware sprites, and these are defined independently. Each one has an XY position and a pattern, and if it's visible, then we'll see it. If it's not, then we won't. We can't use the same hardware sprite for two functions. If we tried to draw a bullet and a player with the same hardware sprite number, they'd either flicker on and off, or the chances are you'd never see one at all. So we need to define an individual number, and we're doing that with this byte here. But also, if this is zero, then we're actually defining that object as still being defined with the old tile map code. And this is beneficial because the Game Boy can do a total of 40 hardware sprites. And our game actually needs more than that because we've got 40 objects for just the object array alone, and then another 16 for the bullets and another one for the player. So we've got the flexibility there a bit that if this is zero, then it's going to be an old tile map sprite, as we were calling it. And if it's a one or more, it's going to be a hardware sprite. And that number will define which hardware sprite is doing the dirty work. OK, so that's the change to the data definitions. Our multi-platform code has also changed. The drawing routine now for the object here, this um, draw object routine has a new piece of code added to the bottom. And this is checking the hardware sprite number. Now, we initialized most of our objects to zero, and we object initialize our bullets to 255s. So we're checking here if the number is zero or 255, and that is defined to be an object that's not using hardware sprites. So we're going to use the old sprite routine. But if it's less than 128, we're going to use the hardware sprite function here. And so that is going to switch out and branch to these two pieces of code, the old tile map code or the new hardware sprite code. So there we go. Now, we're going to, of course, need to define the hardware sprite numbers for all our objects. And we have a little program to do that for us called set hardware sprites. We pass it ix, pointing to the first object, a count in b, and a sprite number in c. And this will consecutively increase these hardware sprite numbers for all the objects up to that count. And we're going to use that to define our objects. That's going to be in here, and we will see that just here. Where is it? There we go. So here we're defining them. We're defining the player object here. You can see again, we've got our weird macros here to compensate for the lack of a real IX on the Game Boy GBZ80. So that's the hardware sprite number, hardware sprite number one for the player. And then we've got the bullet array, the enemy bullet array, the, and then the object array. Now the object array has 40 objects. We don't have enough sprites, but we're defining at least the first half or so with hardware sprites. And as the game progresses to the later levels, you'll start to see some of the objects won't move as smoothly, but can you do? We've got limitations, we've got to work within them somehow. So that's the code that initializes the object. But um, I think I need to go back a step and start discussing the actual technicalities of defining the sprites in VRAM on the Game Boy, because it's a pain, unfortunately. You see, we can't write to the hardware sprites outside of VBlank. Now, we could wait for VBlank, or we could just um, chance it and just write, but we're going to have delays or glitches. And so what we really want to do is we want to define the sprites in RAM and then transfer from RAM into VRAM during VBlank. VBlank is the refresh when the screen is not being drawn, and that's when we can write to the screen. Now, that's what we're going to do. And the Game Boy has actually given us some hardware to help us out with this. It's got what's known as a DMA, which allows for direct memory access and transfers the sprite data from RAM to VRAM automatically with just a single command. The catch is it can't. the code that does that can't be within our main program. It's got to be at the memory address FF80 for reasons that only the Game Boy knows. I don't quite know why that is, but that's what we've got to do. So we're going to have to transfer our interrupt handler to that address. And we're also going to have to turn on that interrupt handler. Now, the cache for the sprites is going to start from D000 here. It's um, 160 bytes in size, A0 in hexadecimal. But um, we're going to allocate 256 just for convenience here. So that's our sprite cache there. Our interrupt handler is going to go here. 
Now you can see here we've put a jump to that interrupt handle at memory address 0040 in our cartridge. That defines the address that will handle the interrupt, but that's not enough to start it. That's just enough for it to work once we've started. Okay, so we're going to need to transfer our interrupt handler to that address FF80. The actual routine that does the work is here. You can see it. we'll have a look at it in a moment. We're also clearing the sprite cache at the start here. So this is defining our interrupt handler and that's just zeroing the start data. If we don't do that, we'll get weird glitches when we start up. So um, we, we definitely want to do that. We end, up, we end up with random sprites on the screen potentially. Okay. So that's initializing the interrupt handle and clearing the buffer, but we still need to turn the sprites on. We do that with memory address FF40 bit one here. We have to set that to turn the sprites on. And then we want that interrupt handle enabled. And we do that with bit zero of memory address FFFF here. And we also need to enable the interrupts using the classic EI command, otherwise nothing will happen. Now this means that our interrupt handler will run when the V blank occurs. So what's the interrupt handler have to actually do? Well, not very much actually. Um, we need to pass the top byte of the GB spike cache address, which was D000. So that would be D0 we're passing. We write that to FF46 and that immediately starts the transfer procedure. Now, all we're doing next is we've got a little delay loop here just to wait for that transfer to complete. And then we're just returning here with the ret i return from interrupt here. And that is transferring the sprite cache from our RAM address to our VRAM. And that solves all the problems for us of waiting for VBlank. All we need to do now is we just need to write to the cache when we want to define a sprite. That's it. That's a bit of a pain, wasn't it? But that's um, unfortunately what we have to deal with on the Game Boy. Now, the main code here has not changed in any way, apart from that initialization you saw before. Now, the main changes have occurred is that there's a new sprite handling routine. Here it is. You can see part of it at this blanking routine. And also, we've now got this new gets H sprite object. Now, this is basically the same as before, checking if the sprite is less than 128 H sprite. If it is, then it's a hardware sprite. Otherwise, it's an old time map sprite. Okay. Now, do get sprite H sprite object is almost the same as the old do get sprite object here. Now, what it's doing here is it's loading in the sprite frame and multiplying it by 16. It's then calculating the tile, the pattern number. The sprites on the Game Boy are using the same patterns as the original background. So we still have to add 96 to get past the font. We're also reading in a palette here for the Game Boy color here. So we've got that. We're loading in our palettes. We're loading in which one of the palettes we want to use for this particular sprite. We're then getting the X and Y position from the current object, which is pointed to by our virtual IX here. These are all macros, as I said before. I'm simulating with macros the commands that are missing from the GVZ80 so that we have effective functionality of a regular Z80. Now, the top left-hand corner of the screen if for sprites is eight across and 16 down. That's the first visible pixel. So I'm adding four here and then I'm doing a shift here. So that's effectively adding eight and we're adding 16 there. So that will move the sprite to the first visible position. And it means that the coordinates will match the tile map coordinates for the purposes of this game. So that's the sort of software function of calculating the, the data for the sprite. The actual set hardware sprite function is here. Um, the, this version has two options to write straight to her, the VRAM of the sprites or the preferred option and what we're using here to write to the cache. So we're selecting the cache memory address. Now each hardware sprite uses four bytes and they're all consecutive. So there is the Y position first, we're just writing that, the X position, the tile number, the pattern number, and then the attributes. And this includes the color on the Game Boy Color and a few other things. So these are the bytes we need to transfer. You can see we're using LDI, which automatically inks HL. That's a Game Boy special command. So that's what we're using there. And we're just turning on interrupts again, just to make sure we're actually gonna update that um, buffer at some point, because some parts of my code turn them off. Now, the palettes you saw there, these are being defined somewhere. Where is it? Here. Here are the palettes. There's one per sprite. And you can see these are relating to these color palettes that are defined here. Now, these are specifying that this sprite will use palette one, which is going to be this one and so on. Now, interestingly on the Game Boy Color, the Game Boy Color uses eight palettes for the background and it uses separate eight palettes for the sprites. Now, I'm actually defining them both as the same set of colors, but we have a new function here. We had before our set GBC palettes here. We're now using another version called set GBC sprite palettes. Um, it's almost identical to the original. 
here it is. Now here's the old version here, and you can see we were loading in from GBPAL and we were writing two bytes to FF68 and FF69. FF68 selects the offset within the palette, the byte offset for the data you're about to send, and FF69 is the data to put in that position. Now with the sprites, we just use FF6A and FF6B in the exact same way. So, I mean, I guess maybe I could have done this a bit smarter and maybe used DE or something here and we could have shared the same code for both. Or of course I could have written the exact same data to both addresses and just set them both at the same time. But I thought I'd create a second version of the code just to give you the flexibility if, unlike me, you wanted to have a different set of palettes for your background and your sprites, which would be totally sensible, just excessive for what I needed here. So that's the sprite definitions. The last change to the code is the clear screen routine. We just need to wipe those sprites off the screen whenever we clear the screen. And that's all there is to it. So it's not actually taken that much work to get the sprites working on the Game Boy. The Game Boy sprite, because of that buffer and I had some trouble remembering how the palettes worked and the interrupts. But um, they say basically speaking, converting the code to use hardware sprites wasn't a great deal of work. So if you want to add hardware sprite functionality to your own code, hopefully today's example will be a good template for you and it should help you out. Of course, you can make the graphics with Acro Sprite Editor. And as I say always, you're totally welcome to use all of anything from my code that helps you out. I don't, you don't need to give me credit or anything. I don't care. So, you know, you make use of it if you can. Anyway, whatever you do, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you found it interesting. If you have, you know, please like and subscribe. We're going to come back to the Game Boy again later on. I'm hoping maybe to do some pixel plotting and go, I've got a vector game. I'm hoping to be our port to the Game Boy as well. So hopefully you'll let me stick around for that and see if I can actually pull that off. But uh, anyway, whatever you do, I wish you all the best with your programming and I hope you have a lot of fun with the Game Boy. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.